Hey guys, my name is Tom Weber. We're here at Five Star Guitars in Portland, Oregon. Yay! Great guys, and uh, I'm happy to be here. We're, uh, we're gonna address the, uh, the concept of setting up a guitar today. We have a beautiful custom shop Frankenstein. Never seen one of these before. But uh, this is a, a great example of a guitar that was obviously uh, created by Ed Van Halen and hopefully carried on by those of us who are fortunate to have them in hand. So we have one today and we're going to go over some of the basics um, and some of the finer points of setting up a guitar. Guitar is, guitar is an instrument that is built in and measured in thousands of inches. It's a very accurate instrument until you add the one inaccurate thing that they all end up with. That's us. Frets are placed in exactly the right place. Strings are tuned to exactly the right pitch. And then we put our mitts on them and pull everything all out of whack. So we're going to discuss a couple of things today that might help with uh, that issue. Um, some of you, it will help immensely. Some of you, maybe not, because you'll be able to play anything if you, if you care to and not have those problems. We hate you guys. But, uh, the rest of us have to figure out how to make do with what we have. This guitar is obviously a, uh, a Floyd Rose equipped guitar. Uh, six strings, thank God. And uh, it plays pretty well. I've had a chance to, to have a hand on this yesterday, so uh, I, know that it's, I know that it's almost where it should be. But uh, we're going to start out by restringing this instrument. Working on a Floyd Rose, that's my very best friend. That is a Bondus 13256 3mm T-handled wrench. And I don't want to work on anything like this without one, and I'll show you why. One of the worst things about working with a Floyd is using a little bitty wrench. You're constantly popping them out of the, out of the, the, the Allen's heads and chasing them around the floor. You don't have that problem with one of these. You can put it in your hand right like that, depress your tremolo arm, use your palm, spin, loosen, spin. You can see that this turns it into, instead of chasing tools across the floor, you have now become a race team pit crew. You can do lug nuts faster than anybody in the world doing it this way. And it allows you to do to get a more consistent uh, tightening because you can watch the thing torque itself, twist itself a little bit as you're tightening. One of the things that, uh, that I learned working with Ed Van Halen is that this will give you more ability than pretty much any tool you're gonna have. So I'd recommend having one of those. Again, we move up to the, we move up to the nut. The parts come out very quickly. Part of what I do for a living is make sure that I can have something ready when my artist needs it. That's not always something that allows you to have time to yourself, so it has to be done quickly. We removed old strings. Now these strings have been tied into place which is something that I don't do. But I'm going to explain how you explain, explain how we do things a little differently than this and why. A lot of guys will go through and wrap the string around and then take the excess and kink it back over to keep it from slipping. And that's a great, great way to keep the guitar where you want it, right up until it's time for you to change a string in a hurry and you have to undo that kink in the string. A lot of times they'll snap off just like this one did. And uh, that's just more time that you have to spend 
figuring out what you're doing. But, uh, typically a client's guitar would, like this, would require a good cleaning. I don't think we're going to do that with a custom shop Frankenstein guitar. It's meant to be dirty and it is absolutely perfect as far as I'm concerned. So we're going to move on to, to, to stringing this guitar. Before we do that, there are a few things that we need to check. You have the mechanics of the Floyd Rose. This is a system that we all know is not infallible. Um, it's something that we have to pay attention to. There are parts that will wear out. There are parts that will break. It's my, it's my opinion that anybody who owns a Floyd Rose has to have parts for one. Um, most typically, the clamping blocks in the bridge saddles, uh, they will mushroom out. Um, they will crack. Uh, they are not very much fun when they do. So there are upgraded parts for that. Um, Floyd Rose has uh, uh, upgraded parts. Um, Adam Revert, FU Tone, uh, has tit titanium upgrade parts. I recommend this stuff highly. Um, when I was working with Ed Van Halen, we'd get probably two shows out of a set of clamping blocks and, because we'd crack them. He wanted them torqued down pretty high. Uh, the titanium parts, 52 shows later, I'm still using the same stuff. Um, I highly recommend, uh, unless you absolutely want period correct parts in your, in your Floyd Rose, do the upgrades. It doesn't matter whose, you know, uh, it's great stuff. And you will notice a difference in how it plays, how it sounds, and your pocketbook will like it a whole lot more when you're not spending money on parts all the time. Um, this guitar, the, the uh, clamping blocks feel pretty good, so we're going to move forward with stringing the instrument. I have here a set of EVH 9 to 42 strings. Obviously, those of you watching are going to be doing Floyd Rose restrings sometime today, I bet or if not, in the near future. So with the Floyd Rose, obviously the, the ball end has to come off. We cut. And here's where my, here's where my, my bondage wrench comes in really handy. Tip the Floyd forward, insert the string, make sure that it's centered. Spin this to a point where it snugs the string where you want it, make sure that you've got it perpendicular to the bridge and torque it in until it's where you think you should have it. Now I know where I know where mine end up because I just start to watch the, the wrench twist. That's one of the reasons that I use the longer wrench. It's a very good indicator as to how much torque I'm putting on that Allen screw. And it's pretty much the same thing every time. And we're just gonna go, go through and Insert these strings. Lock them in position one at a time. Now on the, on the road, I have work boxes that have six tubes in the, in the back of them for strings. So I'm not particularly used to taking them out of packages and unwrapping them. They ship them to me straight. I like it that way. It makes my life a whole lot easier and quicker. But today, we're going to fumble with some strings a little bit. Now, as you can see, the, the palm of my left hand is is busy with the Floyd Rose. I always tip the Floyd forward, no matter what guitar it is, 
it, it's more convenient to to, fl to tip forward on a guitar where the, the the Floyd is set to bottom out on the top. But even with a floating tremolo, it's a safety precaution so that you're not going to miss and mark up the top of your guitar. You can't do a whole lot of damage to a Frankenstein, but you can do it. You can do enough damage to it so that you might notice that something's different on this particular guitar and the value with the value of it. I'm not into adding any more marks than it already came with from the folks at Fender. So. And finally, the high E string goes in, then into place. Torque into torque into being tight. Now, this is a perfect time on, on any other guitar to inspect your fingerboard and the frets. I, I am constantly amazed by how many guitar players have fret wear and don't realize it because they don't look for it. Um, frets have to be, they have to be round, or they should be anyway, at, uh, by design. Um, shouldn't have any grooves in them. If you get some, if you get some little ghost marks in it, that's about the time you want to address it. You don't want to spend time waiting until you're talking major refretting, uh, resurfacing. Um, a little bit of maintenance goes a long way to making your frets last longer. So if you've got a guitar that you play a lot, that's one thing that you have to pay attention to. One of the most important things about owning a guitar is making sure that it stays accurate. These frets are the way that they're supposed to be. This guitar, although it looks like it's been played to death, doesn't appear to have been played an awful lot. I like to set up a guitar just to be strung. I don't like searching for the hole in the tuner. So I orient the tuners so that they are all facing the upward side of the peg head. Or if you're working on three, a guitar with three on a side, basically everything is pointing perpendicular to the travel of the string. Now, I'm going to walk out of frame for a minute because I forgot to grab a tool that I desperately do enjoy using. A few years ago, I found this little, little Ryobi battery operated screwdriver. I like it a lot because it spins 500 RPM, which means that you can string a lot of guitars really quickly. I have that in my day pretty regularly. Now, on this particular guitar, tuners are pretty, are pretty closely spaced. So I usually take the string up to about the second tuner past where I'm going to where I'm going to insert the string, I put a 90 degree bend in it. Now on the two the high and low E strings, you don't have to do anything past that. But I'll insert that string. I'll bend over the the excess, one wrap over the top, the rest of them underneath. And I have people ask, Tom, why do you have one wrap over the top? Well, if you look at if you look at a guitar tuner, contemporary tuners are concave. If you have a, a wrap over the top and the rest of the wraps under the bottom, as you bring the string to tension, the coils gravitate towards the center. That pinches the string, that helps lock it into position. Now that's something that is not, it's kind of redundant on a Floyd Rose because you're locking the strings at the, at the, the nut anyway, but every little bit helps. We're trying to keep, we're trying to keep a guitar accurate, trying to keep it from slipping if at all humanly possible. Found a great use for the, the, the molded end the, for your comfort uh, on, on a tool. 
It's also really great to be able to just go in and fold that little cutoff to, uh, end of the string over so that you're not sticking it in the end of your finger. I've done that about 100,000 times, not particularly enjoyable. One of the toughest things about stringing a guitar with a Floyd Rose that has the retainer on the, or the, on the uh, headstock is getting the string under that retainer. I still use the same, same method for determining where I want the bend in the string. Then I go to the end, and this is, again, something that's particularly useful on a guitar that needs to stay pretty. I put a, I put a bend in the end of the string so that I can run it under that retainer bar and get hold of it without that end digging into the finish. There's nothing worse than having to explain to a customer why there's a scratch in the headstock of their guitar that wasn't there when the guitar came to you for work, or why you have to explain to yourself that you scratched your guitar and, and now you can't sleep because you feel terrible. That's just a little added trick that may make you a happier guitar owner, a guitar technician. But the same thing, one wrap over the top, remaining wraps underneath. And yet again, measure, bend, a small bend at the end. And we have now just run another string in without the possibility of scratching things. Pretty redundant. I'm not sure if we have, do we have a good camera shot for of this. I think we probably do. There are cameras everywhere. As you can see, this method makes things go pretty quickly. One thing that you'll notice, if you, if you do not have a retainer bar on your guitar for your Floyd, or for any guitar for that matter, the number of winds that you use on the tuners can influence the down angle over the nut on your guitar, which can help with sustain, clarity, everything that you want to get out of the guitar is relative to what you put into it. More pressure downward, both at the nut and at the bridge saddle in any guitar, will put more vibration where you want it. Now you'll notice that I did a little something different there. Sooner or later you run out of run out of tuners to measure your string to. So I start pulling the string backwards and measuring to the previous tuners instead of guessing. Does it matter? Not really, but I'm kind of picky that way. Now you notice that I'm keeping, I'm keeping tension on a string. I'm holding it uh, with my index finger to, to create downward uh, the ability to guide the string down below the, the uh, excess part of the string coming through the tuner. And I'm keeping tension on the string with two fingers on my, my right hand so that I get the neatest, the neatest winds possible on the tuner. There's nothing worse than finding out that your guitar is slipping because you have winds stacked on top of one another and they're slipping. So it's another one of those little things that, that you want to pay attention to. Again, I'm doing something different here. I pulled the string to where, it, uh, where it's relatively taut. I'm grabbing that string with my right hand and then I'm pulling it back to the second tuner down the scale. Again, just because I've run out of tuners on the other end to measure from. 
Hope that makes sense to everybody. One wrap over the top, rest underneath. And we have strings. Okay, we've lost. You can see we're using Strobosoft software, I believe. There's no such thing as owning a tuner that's too good. I like the strobe tuners. Yeah. We're gonna rough in the, the, the tuning on this guitar before we stretch strings. I wanna emphasize one thing. One thing about working on a guitar on a bench like this. There are a few things that you can, there are lots of things you can do on the bench, but there are a few things that you never ever want to do because you're gonna end up with results that you don't like. I mentioned first off that a guitar is a very accurate piece of equipment. And this is a, this is a, this is a, a, an opportunity to demonstrate just how delicate the balance is between being in tune and not. I tell people an experience text. Uh, I've, always, I've, I've always gotten strange looks from some of the most experienced people in the world when I tell them that gravity has an effect on your guitar and how it's tuned. Now, if we have a shot of, the, uh, of this tuner, and this, if I hold this guitar so that there is, I'm holding the bottom of the body, there is no pressure on the neck to influence the, how the neck is, uh, the, uh, the geometry of the neck. But if I hold, if I take a note, and I get that note in, in pitch on the tuner, and then I turn the guitar, You watch the tuner. That is almost eight cents flat. That's gonna show up when you start playing. You move the tuner back to the current position or the, the, the prone position, that note's in perfect pitch. You wanna hand your artist a, 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 note, a guitar that's eight cents flat? I don't, because some of them can actually hear it and then you're gonna be in trouble. You always wanna at least look like you know what you're doing. And it's little things like that that will help you to accomplish that goal. Now that we have strings on this guitar, we could lock it down and play it. And in a few minutes, we'd stretch it out of tune and have to unlock it and start all over again. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring forward another tool that I think is probably my fa very favorite. This is called a string stretcher. That's S-T-R-E-T-C-H-A. Stretching strings is the single most important part of having a consistent performance on guitar. You can't spend time trying to figure out why you're out of tune, and this is the best thing that I've found for making sure that you're not. Stretching strings has always been, up to this point, a matter of going through and with your fingertips, stretching a little bit, move, stretch a little bit, move, stretch a little bit, move, stretch a little bit. It's not terribly consistent. Um, it's been accurate enough for decades, maybe centuries, uh, to, uh, but it's also something that you're not getting uniform results across the length of the string. This little tool right here will give you uniform results quickly 
and when you're finished, you're not going to wonder why you can't play guitar because your fingers hurt so bad. The nose end of it clips under, uh, under the string. The tail end of it rides on top of the string. You give a little bit of pressure backwards. I always put my thumb on, at the, the nut end of the string so I keep it from c coming out of the nut slot. And you just glide this thing from one end to the other. I typically do five passes on a string. And five. That is the most accurate means by which to stretch a string that I've found. And when you have 20, 30, 40 guitars to work on in a day and a show to put on, the idea of getting from one end of what you have to do to the other as quick as possible is extremely important. So you have to be able to save time anywhere you can. If you're in a shop working on clients' guitars, you have to be able to save time anywhere you can. This will save time. It will save your hands. It'll save your peace of mind because you're going to look at it when you get a chance to use one and go, holy crap, why haven't I had one of these all my life? Now, I keep three of them at my side on the bench at all times. Because the one thing that you'll notice using these things, depending on how fast you move that tool from one end of this string to the other, you're going to generate a lot of heat. And I found out the hard way that you can actually, if you go fast enough, if you've got a lot of guitars and you're running behind, and you go fast enough stretching strings, you can actually get the string hot enough to melt one of these. So I alternate. I keep three of them, move from one to number two. Now we're not moving real fast here today because we want to show what the tool is and how it works. But I'm still going to use that alternating method. Now I'm giving the tool a chance to cool down. Friction is a wonderful thing if you're planning on starting a campfire. That's not the goal today, so we're just going to continue on with stretching strings and trying not to trying not to melt the tools. You'll develop a rhythm with this tool after you use it a few times that makes it comfortable for you. And once it's comfortable, you're going to not want to do it. You're not going to want to stretch strings the old fashioned way ever again, I promise. And it doesn't take any longer than this to stretch strings. And five. That's a done deal. Now, first inclination is going to be to tighten this guitar down, clamp the strings down. You've changed the temperature of the string by stretching it. I recommend that you allow it to cool because if you don't, when it comes back to being room temperature, it's not going to be in tune anymore. So we give it a few, we give it a few seconds to cool off before we clamp things down. This gives us a good, good opportunity to set up the Floyd Rose to be tuned. The one thing that is really common that guys forget when they're restringing their guitar is that they have probably used the fine tuners and they're not in a great place for the tuning that you're gonna do after you lock the new strings into position. So while we're allowing those strings to cool off a little bit, I'm gonna adjust the fine tuners to where I think they should be in the middle of their travel. I always like to give the, the high E and B just a little bit more capability to be tuned sharp. So I'll let them, I'll back them out just a little more because it seems to take more attention to influence that string than those two strings than the, 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 the larger diameter ones. We're in pretty good shape as far as temperature on this guitar goes, as far as string temperature, because we didn't go very fast with the, the, the stretching tool. So I think we'll move ahead to put the, the locks in position. Now this is a point that is very important on a Floyd Rose. The string retainer bar, the most important part of a, of a guitar nut is, is the trailing edge of it. That's where the string terminates as far as its vibrational capability. 
That's what gives you your note. However, the string on a Floyd Rose nut also has to meet the nut at the headstock end, because if it doesn't, as you clamp that string down, it's gonna move and pull your tuning sharp before it gets tight. There is also the capability of this and probability of the, the clamping blocks to potentially twist a little bit. So at that point, when you snug this thing down, if you don't do it correctly, the higher string is gonna end up being pulled flat while the lower string is gonna be pulled sharp. That's why you'll find that uh, you have to do a lot of fine tuning after you lock this down. So it's very important, whether you're using the, the string retainer bar or the number of winds on the tuners to determine what kind of down angle you've created over the nut, it's very important that the strings meet the nut on both edges. And the quickest way to, to, to determine that, if it's working, is just go through and press on that string a little bit. If it moves, you've got to add more, more winds or you've got to tighten the retainer bar down a little bit to get that string to meet that surface. These meet just fine. So we're in a position where we can actually clamp this guitar down. So we'll, ins and the other part of this whole situation is inspect your parts. Uh, like we said with the, with the clamping blocks here uh, at the bridge, the clamping blocks at the nut are prone to wear. You'll find that there are, are grooves that will wear in these. You'll find that there will be grooves that wear in the nut casting. Those parts are subject to be replaced. So if you have a Floyd Rose and it slips some, check here first, check the nut first. Uh, that's most likely, especially if you've got a guitar that when you use your tremolo, it comes back flat or it comes back sharp. That's a telltale sign that you've got something moving somewhere and it's probably the string passing through the, 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 the clamping block because there's a groove in there that allows it to do so. So those are important important things to look for. Now, at this point, we need to look at the tuner again. I talk too much and the, 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 perfect. I talk too much and the, and the, the iPad's going into standby mode. It's like, will you hurry up already? So we're going to check get our tuning pretty much where we want it. And you notice that the, 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 tuner, the tuner comes up to a point and then it sags back down to going flat. That's just the, the tension of my fingers on the tuner are causing that difference in the tuning. It's just another example of how accurate tuners have to be or a guitar has to be set up to, to actually be in tune. It never will be. I think Andre Segovia said we spend half of our lives tuning our guitars and the other half playing out of tune. And there are no truer words on the face of the planet. I see one of the, one of the fellows here at the shop nodding his head. Yep, that's the name of that. So we're gonna bring this guitar up to pitch. Now with a, with a Floyd Rose resting on the top, we're not gonna have a whole lot of Variation due to the bridge floating, hopefully. The idea, the concept of, of tuning this guitar is different than a floating Floyd because what we're doing, tuning one string, isn't really influencing the strings around it. You gotta love it when the, the high E shows up as an A on the tuner. So we'll go back through and touch, touch this up a little bit because we are influencing the attitude of the neck. The next thing we're gonna be checking once this guitar is in tune is the relief in the fingerboard. With guitar being a, an instrument that's measured in thousands of inches, the one thing that we can't argue with is the math. People, uh, guitar players over the years have decided that somehow having 
excessive relief in the fingerboard is something that's necessary. Um, I don't agree. Uh, comfort is, is a great thing. There's other ways to get the, what you're looking for comfort wise. There isn't another way to make sure that the guitar geometrically is operating at its optimum ability. The only way, the only accurate way to determine whether your fingerboard is straight or how much curve is in it is with a straight edge. We spend big money on machine a straight edge so that we can look at a neck and determine in thousands of inches just exactly what the relief is. Um, not everybody's going to have one, but you have potentially six of them on the guitar. The string under tension is about as straight as you're going to get. So you can go ahead and fret the first fret on a guitar and you put your thumb on the last fret of the guitar and stretch your little finger towards the center of the guitar and uh, press on the string and see the distance that it has to move to get to the fret. This guitar has probably about 10 thousandths of relief there. That's where I like it. That neck is as close to flat without being dead flat as what I consider to be optimum. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. If you have relief in your neck, if you got too much relief in your neck, you're pressing a certain amount here to get to the fret, you're pressing a certain amount here to get to the fret, and you may be pressing more here. Not a good idea. The guitar plays more in tune at either end. You set the intonation for the upper end of the fingerboard, but the middle of it plays sharp. That's because for the distance that you're pressing to get to the fret, it's the same as moving that string out of being a straight line and pulling the neck sharp, pulling the string sharp. So I like to, I like to keep a guitar as straight as humanly possible, as flat as humanly possible, because the geometry dictates that that's what will give the most consistent results in the playing position. And again, you notice I'm not checking this on the bench, I'm checking it in the playing position because that's where it's gonna be when it matters. So the most accurate place to get your measurements is in the playing position. Same thing with setting the intonation. Intonation has to be set in the playing position my recommendation for anybody that's setting guitars for someone on an intonation day, that's the day that you make sure that the person that plays the guitar is the person that's holding the guitar when you're setting the intonation. Because if you set it for you, it's good for you. And unless you're planning on owning that guitar at some point, set it up for the guy that owns it. If they're heavy handed, you're gonna to have to set the intonation flat to compensate for the fact that they are pressing the string harder than it's necessary to make the note. When the string meets the fret, that's your note. When the string meets the fingerboard, you can watch the difference on the, on the tuner. We'll just go ahead and grab a note here. Grab an A on the sixth string. Now, watch what happens when I push that all the way to the fingerboard. It's the diff difference between being It settles into being one, one, two cents flat. If I press it to the fingerboard, it's 37, 38, 39, 42, 42 cents sharp. So if you've got somebody playing guitar, you're working on a guitar for a guy that has a, an excessive grip with a left hand, you set it up for yourself and you touch the fret, technically correct but it's not going to be okay for the guy that owns the guitar. So they have to be there that day, or you're liable to hand them a guitar that's 30, 40 cents wrong for them. It makes sense. I know it's a pain in the butt, but if you set up a guitar for the player, that player is going to come and see you every single time. Uh, if you're setting it up for yourself, always play, always think, fret the note the, the way that you would play the note you're gonna be a whole lot happier as, as time goes by. It'll be accurate. So I know that this guitar is intonated. So we're just gonna check the tuning here, give it a little, little touching up. We'll lock it down and see what we end up with. All right, 
looks good. We'll go ahead and I, again, I lock the nut on this guitar in the playing position. I can find the damn nut. Now, we would really love it if each note locked in, in tune. It's not going to, so we're gonna to have to, that's where fine tuners are our best friend. When you strike a string, it usually show, registers a little bit sharper than what it's going to settle into. Don't be afraid to let the note reson, resonate for a while, and, and that, that'll be the pitch that you're ultimately looking at. And there you have it. That is one red, red, white, and black striped guitar that plays the way that it's supposed to. I hope that this has helped you a little bit. By all means, if you have questions, search for your answers. It's the little stuff that makes all the difference in the world. And I can't stress that enough. Um, hopefully everybody's learned a little something today always looking for new ways to do things, new things to understand, because the day we stop learning is the day we start forgetting stuff. So open your mind, open your eyes, pay attention. Everything does make sense on a guitar sooner or later. It may not seem like it, but you'll find what works for you, find what works for your customers, and everybody will be happy. Thanks so much for watching. I appreciate it. You all take care. All right. Fantastic. That's the first time I've done this on film. All right.